I want to talk today about an experience I had that shaped the past 10 years of my life and how I came to believe that we can make a difference working within the system as opposed to outside of it. And the reason I want to tell this story is that it scared me half to death for this country we live in. But at the same time, I came to realize that we ourselves are the check and balance over powerful decisions that shape our lives. And we can help shape those same decisions. So 10 years ago, ju just before and during September 11th, I found myself as human rights advisor to the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. And before that, I'd been working for a number of human rights groups, going door to door, researching cases of human rights violations, writing letters to government, basically trying to influence government policy from the outside. Then suddenly, I was on the inside of government in a very powerful office during the time when we were creating a new immigration law for Canada. And this was the first time our immigration and refugee policies had been significantly revamped since about World War II. So very quickly, I felt that I was in just so far over my head. Uh, each decision that we took would literally affect thousands of lives. And the way these decisions were made wasn't at all what I expected. I had this image of all powerful politicians making very rash decisions on big issues they needed to be talked down from. And instead, what I found were dozens of decisions going by every day at the speed of light, framed by unelected officials in a way that was much like a multiple choice test. So, minister, you have option A, B, and C. Choose quickly because the, deci the decision needed to be made yesterday. Now, how you ask a question largely determines the answer. And the way those options were framed was extremely important. And as I started to read, I'd say, wait a minute, A and B are the same, C is impossible, we'll get killed politically, and there are options here that haven't even been presented. On top of this, even before September 11th, but afterwards it got much, much worse, obviously, there was already a wave sweeping through government that national security trumped all. So instead of proposing a policy and looking at it in three ways, well, what's every way a bad guy can find a loophole? How will this affect a genuine refugee seeking protection? And how will this affect an honest immigrant trying to build a life in this country? It was security, security, security. And when I saw the first draft of that law on my desk, it seemed to erode all the, kind, all the principles I thought this country was built upon. If I could sum it up, it was basically, well, now that I'm here, slam the door and lock it shut behind me. Once an issue is framed as, minister, this is a matter of national security, he or she has no choice but to say yes. Whatever the political party, any politician would feel it would be irresponsible not to do so, or to take anything other than a better safe than sorry approach. But what wasn't fully explained were the consequences. So long-term detention without charge meant reversing the principle of innocent until proven guilty. The law proposed to detain all refugee claimants who didn't have proper documents. But if you're a genuine refugee, you can't very well go to the government you're fleeing and ask for a passport. So what was happening was that they were casting the net just very wide, and a lot of innocent people were going to get hurt. And I remember sitting at this board table, feeling like this young, inexperienced kid. And I must have looked about 12 at the time. But there must have been 15 or more middle-aged men who had been in the department for 20 years. And they just masterfully presented the broad strokes of the new law to the minister. And I left that room with this sickening feeling that it was sink or swim. But it was then that I saw just how important and how powerful outside groups are. So just people writing letters, meeting with their MPs, nonprofit organizations submitting briefs, it was these outside forces that absolutely played a very necessary role as a check and balance and made a real difference in trying to beat that law back to the center. So we'd go into these bizarre decision days where the three wise men of the department, as they were called, would present this case for the refugee crackdown, and then I'd flip through all of these materials and try and lay out an alternative course of action, just to try and broaden out the range of choices that the minister had to make a decision. But clearly, this didn't go far enough. When we introduced the bill into parliament, the old reform party argued to the left of the liberals. <laughs> so clearly, there were huge gaps. For one, these groups were at a big disadvantage. 
Powerful companies can hire expensive lobbyists who understand that the best time to influence a law is before it goes to Parliament. But many groups would send a letter into the wrong minister three weeks after the decision was made. Second, there just weren't enough groups willing to tackle the very difficult questions head on. So the question in government at that time wasn't whether or not we were going to detain, it was where to draw the line. And where groups refused to enter into the discussion, they took too principled a stand and refused to really talk about those uncomfortable questions, the extreme cases set the bar for how far the policy was going to go, and extreme cases make bad law. So this is why I've spent the past 10 years trying to help citizens groups or strengthen their ability to wade in and have a real impact on government policy. But what I take from this is whatever your issue, we can't assume all perspectives are on the table. The only way to make sure that your point of view is presented and heard is to do more than just vote. So I want to switch now to this question of, well, what difference can one person make? How can you take an issue that's bothering you and have an impact on the decisions that shape it? And to answer that, I want to get some myths out of the way. So famous people dancing with Africans can change the world. <laughs> I love the tango. <laughs> no, but the myth here is that only a privileged few can make a difference. It's not true. What I've seen in government is large, powerful organizations fail and smaller, seemingly disconnected groups succeed. And it's a matter of learning how the system works, when's a good time to bring your issue forward, and which tactics are likely to resonate for your cause. Secondly, you have to be connected, or you have to know someone in government. If you know someone, it's almost never the person who's directly involved or has authority over the decision you're interested in. So this is where you get passed around and around and around and nothing happens. More than that, if you know someone, more often than not it backfires. So if a group is granted funding because a politician pulled strings over the objections of colleagues, there's so many ways that that decision will just be delayed or reversed a short time later. The check may take forever to arrive, or they just wait till a new government's in power and a new political party. If that happens and you've taken a shortcut, you'll be frozen out indefinitely. So it's not that you have to be connected, it's that you have to know how to make the right connections. And everywhere in government, there are internal advocates, people whose job it is, is to present a perspective that you share. And if you can arm them with solid information, and anticipate where the opposing concerns are going to come from and prepare them to meet that criticism head on, you're in a much better you have a much better chance of actually seeing the change you're looking for. So the third myth is that politicians have all the power and all it takes is political will. One of the things that surprised me most in government was how little authority our elected representatives have to make changes and see them through. Yes, politicians have the power to make decisions, but it's the bureaucracy that has the power to make them happen. I'm going to go back to my immigration days for a really clear example of this. One of the biggest wins for human rights advocates was that the minister agreed to introduce an appeal on the decision of whether or not someone was at risk of torture or death if returned to their home country. Now, the minister put this appeal in the law over the fierce objections of officials. It went to Parliament, they heard the arguments from all sides, and the MPs and the senators agreed with the advocates, and the appeal was included in the, law as, included in the bill as it was signed into law. Now, what happened next is disturbing for our democracy. It fell back to those same officials to implement the new policy. And by separating the funding for the appeal from the funding for the rest of the bill, the new law came into force with an appeal on the books, but not in reality. Now, it's an extreme example, but clearly it's about much more than political will. It's about building support top down and bottom up, so that when you see a change, it happens not just in words, but in action. So I want to take a minute and just talk about what we don't want. This is the result of some environmental lobbying in Japan. And what we don't want is for you to feel like your time's wasted. You're busy people, and if you're going to put any time into an issue that you believe in, the last thing you want to do is feel like you're banging your head against the wall. 
But through a process of just clearly articulating what it is you want to achieve, combined with a basic understanding of when's a good time to bring it forward, you can make sure that whatever, whatever you have to put into it, it's not going to be in vain. So if you can only do one meeting, if you can only write one letter, how can you make sure that that action has the best possible chance of moving your cause forward? So the last myth I want to talk about is this idea, oh, the system is just too messed up, politicians are too corrupt, there's no point. I tend to think of people who take this perspective as radical, but because they're also idealists in a way. They believe the problems are just so deep-rooted that we need to dismantle what we have and start from scratch. But how many of us can wait until we can break it all down and start again? And even if we could build something new, would it be any better? I believe we need both radicals and reformers to achieve social change. If the harshest critics of the World Bank and the IMF weren't calling for us to dismantle those institutions, the decision makers would have little incentive to do more than tinker with the status quo. But from what I've seen in government today, there's too many radicals and far too few reformers. We need to learn how the system works and make it work for us. And if you do that, if you can do that, you will see a difference. So I've spent the past, 10, well, the past year and a half, I've long since left government, and I've spent the past year and a half on the steering committee of what was the G8, G20 campaign. And this summer, we convinced a conservative prime minister to put a billion dollars into saving the lives of mothers and children in the developing world. Thank you. And what was interesting is that this was not a group that was a natural ally or a constituency of this prime minister. Human rights groups, AIDS activists, development organizations aren't who you would normally think of as well-connected or powerful. But it was this process of just clearly articulating the arguments, bottom up and top down, and making adjustments where it made sense, and most importantly, framing the issue in a way that made sense to this government at this time. But what we achieved required compromise. It's messy, and it's always going to be really messy. And this dynamic of radical versus reformer was very present when Harper announced that the new initiative would not include funding for abortion. So some groups withdrew their support immediately. But several of the pro-choice pro groups took this reformist approach and continued to support the prime minister. And here's why. Politics is ultimately about learning to live with those who disagree with us. And if the main groups arguing for this initiative withdrew support because we didn't get everything we wanted, it was very likely that what we would have had was much, what, what he would have committed to would be much smaller scale. And every dollar cut back meant more lives would be lost. And the reality on the ground is that unsafe abortion accounts for 13% of maternal deaths. And what we were after was a major political commitment to tackle the main reasons women and children were dying that we do know how to fix. Malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, postpartum hemorrhage. There's plenty of work to go around, and other countries were willing to step up and fund the abortion piece. So rather than sacrifice the entire initiative on principle, we chose to support it as an important step. And that step put us on track to being able to save half a million women and 4.5 million children. So that brings me where I am today. And I believe change does happen, but it happens in small steps. But incremental reform is the triumph and frustration of our democracy. Where there's a radical on one side, there's a radical on the other. And the reason for our system is to keep these radicals in check. And to do that, we need our leaders to find a balance between opposing points of view. I believe we need a shift in our way of, th in our way of thinking away from this idea that winning means I've got my way completely. In fact, to have it all one way would be authoritarian. But the good news is we're not the ones who have to compromise. That's the job of the politicians. But if we want them to truly represent our views, we have to, do, we have to make them known loud and clear. I'm just going to end. I'm going to end by breaking one of the TED commandments, or I should say, not the Ten Commandments, the TED Commandments. Um, I've had this photo 
hidden in the bottom of a trunk for the past 10 years. And through the process of preparing this talk, I finally feel ready to bring it out, make it my Facebook page. I can, <laughs> can finally say, you know, I believe in working within the system. And I hope I've convinced you to uh, shake George Bush's hand too. Maybe not with such as wide a grin, but <laughs> thanks.